always online DRM is somewhat of a commonplace these days that has widespread use in the gaming industry for better or for worse. Its intent is to control the gaming experience and ensure a level playing field and to stop cheating. You can also open up games for online only rewards and features and to keep telemetry of the player experience. With an online server, the game can be adjusted server side without any client downtime. These servers can also act as an authentication mechanism, which means that it's possible to detect for illegal copies of a game being played on a PC, for example. But there's a flip side to this coin. What about single player games? If you get disconnected while playing the game, you're removed from the game completely until a server connection is re-established. And of course, if that game has reached its end of life and the publisher deems that the servers need to be removed, then that game is forever lost, unable to be played ever again. My opinion is single player games should always be playable offline in perpetuity. And when it comes to always online DRM, the end result is that it hurts the paying customer and only benefits the software pirate. But what is the origin of online only single player DRM? It all goes back to 2010 and a company known as Ubisoft, one of the biggest publishers in the world. They were the very first company to introduce this DRM to the world. And in today's episode, we're going to take a closer look. And during the early 2000s, Ubisoft would offer PC versions of their hit franchises. But in many instances, they would cripple these versions with DRM. This would take the form of Star Force DRM. And we've covered Star Force on the channel before. Ubisoft was very much aware of software piracy, going all the way back to the days of the Commodore Amiga, a haven for crackers and pirates to spread releases worldwide thanks to dial-up modems and bulletin boards. Ubisoft would rely on Star Force for the majority of their releases in the early 2000s, maxing out at Star Force 3 for Splinter Cell Chaos Theory, which took a staggering 424 days to crack. But Star Force DRM would soon be on its way out. In 2006, Ubisoft would drop Star Force protection from its up and coming releases. Many thought incorrectly that this was due to Ubisoft listening to the feedback of its customer base. Many were unhappy with the heavy handed approach that Star Force applied to their games. But unfortunately, this wasn't the case at all. In fact, you could say that Ubisoft would double down. In 2010, Ubisoft would release two games on PC early in the year, Silent Hunter 5 and Assassin's Creed 2. Assassin's Creed 2 in particular was a massive title for the company, and the PC version of course would offer full support for better resolutions and frame rates. Both of these games introduced a new DRM method replacing Star Force, known as Ubisoft DRM. It would require a constant internet connection, the user would be required to register an account with UbiPlay's service, then launch into the game, which would not only check periodically for a connection, but would also push game-specific data to the server and request data back from the server. This had the side effect of not only turning a single-player game into one with a mandatory online requirement, it also meant that if your connection or the server was lost, then progress of your game is lost. This would be corroborated by PC Gamer, while reviewing the game said the following. The game first starts the Ubisoft Game Launcher, which checks for updates. If you try to launch the game when you're not online, you hit an error message right away. So I tried a different test, start the game while online, play a little, then unplug my net cable. This is the same as what happens if your net connection drops momentarily, your router is rebooted, or the game loses its connection to Ubisoft's master servers. The game stopped, and I was dumped back to a menu screen, all my progress since it last autosaved was lost. This would be compounded when Ubisoft servers would go down for an extended period of time just days after the launch of Assassin's Creed 2. PC gamers were furious, unable to play the game that they'd paid good money for, and demanded an explanation. Ubisoft officially responded saying that this was only a very small percentage of gamers that were affected, and it was due to a distributed denial of service attack, or DDoS. Ubisoft apologized for the inconvenience and reassured their customers that they had the issue under control. But the reality was, end users were experiencing connection issues more than 24 hours later. But at the same time as this, software pirates already had the upper hand and were not tied down by the quality of their internet connection. 
On March 4th, two days after the launch of Silent Hunter 5 on PC, legendary scene group Skid Row would release a PC crack for Silent Hunter 5. This crack would replicate the online server responses that the game would be passing to it. Ubisoft would then release a statement suggesting that the crack was incomplete and didn't work. However, this was in contrast to end users who said that the Skid Row crack was working fine. As it turns out, the truth is somewhere in the middle. Skid Row's crack did work mostly. However, it was not 100% complete. And as such, the scene decided to nuke the crack. 100% working or not, what this crack did was motivate other scene cracking groups to come up with a method to circumvent the Ubisoft Online DRM once and for all. When Assassin's Creed 2 released, different groups would work on their own circumvention. The first would be an individual known as Dormine, who released a server emulator that required the user to change network settings on their PC to route network data to the emulator rather than Ubisoft's network servers. About two weeks later in late April of 2010, scene group Skid Row would release their own crack of Assassin's Creed 2. And in typical scene drama, Dormine accused Skid Row of just taking their work and packaging it up as a more traditional crack that didn't require any host PC network configuration changes. Ubisoft would then go on to release The Settlers 7 on March the 23rd, 2010, and this game would also contain Ubisoft DRM. At launch in some parts of the world, users were unable to connect and get into a game. Ubisoft had claimed that there was an issue when linking authentication keys to multiplayer profiles, and that a fix was coming soon. This issue would resolve itself within about 12 hours. However, the real fix would come around 48 days later when Razor 1911 cracked the Settlers 7 DRM, taking a swipe at Skid Row and suggesting that Skid Row only cracked Assassin's Creed 2 due to publicly available information and Dormine's crack, rather than doing the hard work themselves. According to the NFO file, the Settlers 7 was far more sophisticated than Assassin's Creed 2, and they also congratulated Ubisoft for their DRM, calling it a return to the good old times. Splinter Cell Conviction was the next game to release on April the 29th of 2010. This of course was another high profile release and once again contained Ubisoft DRM. However, this time round, it didn't need 48 days to crack. Skid Row had cracked the game in less than 24 hours. And on June the 12th, 2010, Prince of Persia The Forgotten Sands released on PC, once again with Ubisoft's DRM. And once again, it was Skid Row who would crack the game in about two weeks. Skid Row would give insight to how the challenge server response works and how that it's a different implementation for each game that's being cracked. So a release can take either a short amount of time or many, many days of work. In November of 2010, Ubisoft released Tom Clancy's Hawks, again with Ubisoft's always online DRM. This would be the last game to ever feature it in this implementation. And the game itself would take nearly two years to crack. The reason for this is unclear, but perhaps it was not as high profile as a game such as Splinter Cell, Assassin's Creed, or Prince of Persia. Ubisoft was certainly aware of what was going on, and they knew that the DRM was quite heavy handed. And as a result of the disaster of 2010, they somewhat offered a better approach to their online only DRM by relaxing the always online requirement and replacing it with a one time only server check and then the game could be played entirely offline. The first game to feature this was Assassin's Creed Brotherhood in 2011. By 2012, Ubisoft had abandoned its archaic DRM, admitting it was the customer outcry that allowed it to change its policies. They said, if you look back at early 2011 and before, we did at one point in time go with always on activation for any game. We realized that while it was probably one of the strictest forms of DRM, it wasn't the most convenient for our customers. We listened to the feedback and have removed that requirement from those games and stopped doing it going forward. Now at this point, I wish I could tell you that this story has a happy ending, but as we know, always online activation for single player games continued to become more and more popular within the industry. Other publishers quickly followed suit and offered always online activation for their single player games. The biggest example of this would be Electronic Arts. Ubisoft did end up repatching many of their single player games and removing the online DRM completely. This means that you can play Assassin's Creed 2 on a modern PC without any type of online activation, which is pretty cool. However, 
they didn't do it for all their games, and one such example of a game is Might & Magic 10 Legacy. For some unknown reason, Ubisoft was not interested in patching the game to be playable completely offline, and when they removed the online DRM servers in 2021, the game simply could not be played. Of course, fans and customers of the game were unhappy, and unfortunately, Ubisoft were not interested in actually patching the game. Rather, what they did was to simply remove the game for sale on Steam, with zero communication to their customers. Now, to be fair on Ubisoft and to give them credit, they did make good on this, announcing that in October of 2021, they said, we're happy to announce that all conditions are met to bring the game back to the Ubisoft store and onto Steam and that new and returning players can now venture into the wide and mysterious world of Ashen again. And now in 2023, as I'm actually making this episode, I'm seeing reports of the Diablo 4 servers being offline. And it's just a reminder that the industry continues to make the same mistakes over and over again. And it's becoming more and more apparent to me that we're living in an age where video games are being paraded out in some kind of glass cabinet and you have the ability or have a ticket to play that game for a certain amount of time. Unfortunately, that ticket has an expiration date and that expiration date is when the publisher deems that the game does not need to be on any online service anymore. This is a far cry, no pun intended, to the old days where I used to buy physical media and know that I could do anything I wanted with that physical media, including dump the game itself. But rather than go on another 10 minute rant about online only DRM, we're going to leave it here for today's episode. I do hope you enjoyed this history lesson. Ubisoft was the first, but other publishers had similar things in the works. But that's going to do it for today's episode, guys. Thank you so much for watching. If you liked it, please don't forget to leave me a thumbs up. Enjoy this video and I'll catch you guys in the next one. Bye for now.